griefs again in Jesus' name. What I want to talk about here is try to set the record straight on before and after conversion. You know, what is a real Christian compared to a professed Christian, as we talk about in almost all our lessons? But so many people don't seem to get it. So many people are still living in Romans 7. They're still living as the wretched man with the desperately wicked heart and the filthy rags presented to God, like they're some kind of royal son in rags. They're still, 1 John 1.8 is their, is their mantra. If I say I have no sin, if I say I have no sin, they sing it like a song. And they call themselves Christians. we got so many teachers out there that say they're holiness teachers, but they're preaching that you gradually come out of your sin, die daily, repent all the time like a revolving door, sin, repent, sin, repent, on your way to some kind of holy life that you're supposed to be empowered by God, but you're still living in your sin. You're still falling prey to your same sinful, sinful addictions that you were supposed to have repented of. Let's see what the scriptures teach. Let's just go through some of the scriptures here in the next few minutes and try to understand what it means before you were in Christ and when you're in Christ. This, what does the scripture say? Well, certainly we have Acts 26, 18. It says, when Jesus told Paul, he says, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In other words, they, you get purified by faith, like Acts 15, 9 says. Open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, power of Satan to God. Now, how can there be an in-between place there? How can there be a tree growing good fruit and bad fruit? How can you be stepping in and out of the light all the time by returning to your sins? See, people don't seem to understand that today. And they can't pick it up when they hear other preachers, other teachers on the channel saying it. It sounds good. They're always talking about duty. But as I said before, it's with the human frailty that you're going to fall all the time, even though you're empowered by God. But that's not what the scriptures teach, folks. They have no idea what it means to be redeemed from the corrupting influence of sin, delivered from that darkness to the light and from the power of Satan to God. And it's what they do is they languish in this halfway world of in-between in which they think Jesus has them covered and empowered while they continue in their sin, either gradually coming out of it or dying daily or repenting every day. And then they call themselves the Roman wretch, the chief of sinners, uh, filthy rags. You know, you still have a defiled heart and all the rest of it. Not everybody's the same. Not everybody goes to that length. But still, it's your royal sons in rags. But Scripture makes it crystal clear what it is before you're redeemed, as I, as I have outlined on my board. And I know it's difficult to see, and I'll try to remedy that with some, with some things on, on the videos. And the outlines always posted on the websites are in some document study that I've written. Okay, the Scripture says, before you were saved, before you were saved, you were the wretched man with a defiled heart, a slave to sin. You were the chief of sinners, dead in your sins, in darkness, not in the light, desperately wicked heart, the root of evil remaining in you, alienated from God, foolish, ignorant of God, deceived and disobedient, formerly a blasphemer, like Paul says. That describes, basically, in many scriptures, what a person was before they came to Christ. Well, well let's see what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once, once walked in the course of this world, according to the prince in the power of the air, in the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you were once conducted yourself in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of your flesh in the mind, and you were by nature children of wrath. Well, because you were, you'd given yourself over, not, not that your nature or your flesh is, is sinful, but you'd given yourself over to your sinful desires. So before you were saved, what's it say in that scripture? It says, okay, you were following the course of this world, the prince and the power of the air. You were disobedient. You conducted yourself by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Whatever was in your carnal mind. In another scripture, it says in Titus 3.3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, 
serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But then, you know, then when the grace and glorious come, that, that's what transformed you as it goes on to say in that scripture. So, in these scriptures it's telling you were dead in your sins, your spirit was dead, even though your body is alive, you're dead while you live, dead to God, blind, foolish, disobedient, addicted to your lust, under the direct influence and sway of Satan. And in another scripture in Colossians 1.21, it says you were alienated, for you were once alienated and enemies of God in your mind by wicked works. Okay? Another scripture in Philippians 3.18, he says, You walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Your God is your belly. Describes many people today walking around as self-propelled stomachs with only directed by their lust of their flesh. Nothing to do with God. They call themselves Christians, but they have nothing, nothing idea what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be redeemed from every lawless deed. And then you got the scriptures in Romans that they, they love to apply to themselves. The scriptures in Romans chapter 3. See, none righteous and all have sinned and none is good and a mouth full of cursings and feet swift to shed blood. No fear of God before their eyes and all have sinned and shall fall short of the glory of God. It's all talking about before you were redeemed. You can't say, oh, we've all sinned. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. How can you fall short of the glory of God when you're purged, purified and crucified? walking worthy of him. How can that be? You see what I mean? But they take those scriptures all the time. That's describing the condition of a person that's lost in their sin, taken from Psalm 14 and 53 and many other places, but that's the main ones. The main ones about all have sinned and there's none righteous are taken from Psalms that say in the very first verse of each Psalm, 14 and 53, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Do you say that again? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Among those, they have none righteous. Among those, all have sinned. Among those, all fall short of the glory of God. Not among those that are redeemed and purified by faith. How can you fall short of the glory of God when you're walking in newness of life with the flesh crucified? Well, if you're a professed Christian, saved under the received Jesus, and you're going to come out of sin gradually lie. Well, I suppose that's what you think. In the Isaiah 64, 6, in Jeremiah 17, 10 scriptures, the, 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 the ones they love the most, the, the filthy rags in the wretched heart, the desperately wicked heart. I've had, I've, we've seen people arguing until they're blue in the face and then finally condemning us as devils going to hell because we say... A, person born of God does not have a desperately wicked heart, nor is their righteousness as filthy rags. These scriptures where it says in Isaiah 64, 6, we are all like an unclean thing, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. In Jeremiah 17, 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Why can't you go to those scriptures and read in the context of where they were written and who they were speaking to? They were speaking to a desperately wicked, fallen people. Who couldn't come out of, who couldn't do anything but sin because they loved their sin, kind of like most professed Christians. Among those, they were desperately wicked. Among those, there was no, no, un, they were all unclean in their filthy rags. Among those, their heart was desperately wicked. Who could know it? In the very next verse, it says in Jeremiah 17, 11, they never quote that one, that God tests the mind, he knows the heart, he gives to each one according to their ways and according to the fruit of their doings. Wasn't well, that the same thing as the parable of the sower, where the seed falls on the good and faithful, the good ground? In other words, it means honest and an honest heart, prepared to receive it, so that it can take root, the engrafted word can take root, spring up and produce a result, produce the good fruit. See, that's the problem. See, there's never a good heart. There's never an honest man that can come to the Lord and empty himself of all guile under this mess of, well, I'm the wretched man, and I'm the desperately wicked, filthy rags, all that nonsense. But yet it's constant. You, you hear this constantly in professed people. I'm not just talking about the church, folks. I'm through talking about the church because we all know it's apostate. The system churches are totally in apostate 
lawless, they're a culture of immorality. What I'm talking about is the folks out here on the internet that have think they've come out of this mess, but yet they're still under the same delusions, but can't even discern it. That's what I'm trying to say before and after here. When you're in Christ, you're victorious in Christ. Let's see, Paul. They always call Paul the chief of sinners and say that he was, uh, he was currently sinning all the time. They say, well, Paul was the chief of sinners. Paul was the wretched man of Romans 7. In Romans 7, he teaches he can't do what's right. He wants to do what's right. He can't do what's right. So he can't. And they all live in Romans 7. Well, if you want to live in Romans 7 as carnal, sold under sin, I guess there's nothing I could say to persuade you otherwise, which has been proven on the, on the channels, in the, in the comments, in the blogs. But if you want to come out of being the wretched man into Christ and redeemed from every lawless deed, set free from sin, well, there's a way to do that in Christ. And it's through repentance and faith proven by deeds. What's Paul say about himself? He says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. It says that in 1 Timothy 1.13, where in verse 15, it talks about the chief of sinners. See, he's talking, he's talking in the historical present. In other words, he's talking, yes, I am the wretched man when in, formal, in my formal condition, my former condition, when I was a blasphemer. Just like Romans 7, it's speaking in a historical present tense of a man that's struggling with his sin and needs to be set free in Christ. Like it says, who can set me free? And then the law of, of Christ, the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So I'm not the wretched man anymore. Now I'm the righteous man in Christ doing what's right by the Spirit empowering me. And that's not works. That's not trying to save yourself. That's what the scriptures teach. So I was formerly this person. And when he says, oh, wretched man that I am, what, who can deliver me from this body of death? I just explained that. Says, what can deliver you? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus can make me free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, the righteous requirements of the law can be upheld in me if I walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, the flesh crucified with its passions and desires. Not the flesh, what we live in, the body we serve in the flesh, but the indulgent passions and desires that inflame your flesh and that you go out and sin with your hand and with your eye, with your feet. That's what it's talking about. You don't drive nails through your hands. So that's former. What's some of the other things he says? He says, I have, he says, uh, in Ph the Philippian scripture, though that I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in his flesh, I more so. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee and concerning zeal of persecuting the church and righteousness of the law, which is in the law, I was blameless. See, those things he counts as dung for the righteousness that's in Christ. To do what's right by faith, working by love, purifying his heart of sin. So he can say then that now he's blameless. Now his conscience is clear before God and man. So he was formerly a blasphemer. A Christian is not the wretched man of Romans 7. He's not, if I say I have no sin, I lie and I have no truth. How can you be, have sin in you and be cleansed of all sin at the same time? See how that doesn't make sense? He says, he that is born of God sinneth not, because that seed of God is in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. It's in 1 John 3, 6. Don't you ever get to that part? See, who says as he's walking in Christ and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and there's no truth in him. So if you're walking in Christ, you say you're in Christ, you're in darkness, you got sin in you all day long, you got the revolving door of sin repent going on in your life, the cycle of never-ending sin, there's no truth in you. You're not keeping his commands. His commands are to abide in him, to go and sin no more. Take up your cross and follow. See, there's no magic cover to commit your sin. The scripture says, let the just remain unjust. He says, the unjust, let him be unjust still. Who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. In Revelation 22, 11. 
at the great resurrection. He who is unjust is not going to be magically just, like they're talking about in glorification, then your flesh will be gone and you'll, and you'll be able to live without sin. That's a lie. That's not what the scriptures teach. Yes, in glorification, you'll be given a new, new glorified body in, in, uh, in the resurrection, in eternity. It's not talking about you because your flesh, you're going to sin, as you've been taught. So if you're filthy, you're filthy still. So if you got filthy rags unto God constantly all day long, all my righteousness is filthy rags, and you think that that's going to save you because you keep confessing that, you think sin keeps you humble instead of hardening your heart, well, then you'll be filthy still. He who is unjust will still be unjust. But he who is righteous, he is doing what's right. The righteousness of the saints, that's their white robes, Revelation 19.8. The righteous acts of the saints is their robes, their white linen that they're wearing at, at that time, in the great supper of the Lamb. They will, be right, they will be righteous still. He who is holy will be holy still. Because Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So you must be worthy of him to follow him. Make that commitment and that determined resolve to put to death the old man and take up your cross and follow Christ. So if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin, just like Paul saw, talked about in Romans chapter 6. It's either sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. There's no middle ground here. If you're serving sin, this revolving door, sin repent all the time, that many of the evangelist street preachers out there are teaching, hoping that you'll be on the right side of the line when, when you die, you know, when you meet that, that last breath, then you're not in Christ. Because if you commit sin, meaning if you're producing sin, a bad tree producing bad fruit, that's what that word means in the Greek, the paeo, then you're a slave to sin because you're a slave to whom you obey, whether it's sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So if you say you have fellowship with him and you walk in darkness, that's where you lie and you don't practice, you don't, you don't have the truth. You're not producing the truth in your life. See, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the, those that are defiled and unbelieving or disobedient, pretty much the same thing, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him because their works are works of iniquity based on a defiled heart, a filthy rag heart being abominable and disobedient into every good work reprobate or disqualified. That describes a person that's not in Christ. Now, what describes a person that is in Christ? How does the scriptures describe a person that's been redeemed from every lawless deed? Well, in one scripture I can think of in Colossians chapter 3, in verses 1 through 3, it says, You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, so set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. Well, I read it backwards in my, in my mind, starting in verse 1, 2, 3. But nevertheless, it's what it's talking about. So you died with Christ, like, just like it says in, in Romans chapter 6. You died knowing this, that the old man was crucified. The body of sin put to death once and for all. That happens in repentance. So few people can get this. That is the act that happens in repentance. You can't reoccur and reoccur like Hebrews 6 talks about. You can't keep re-crucifying him by sinning and confessing all day long. And I'm talking about sins unto death here, folks. So the, the righteous man is redeemed, the, 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 those in Christ are redeemed from every lawless deed, set free from sin, partakers of the divine nature. The good and honest heart received the word. It was prepared to receive the word. It was a repented, emptied heart of guile and deceit and rebellion, prepared to receive the word, and then it fell onto the good heart, the good soil, the honest heart, and it produced an increase, like Luke 8, 15 talks about. You purged and purified by the blood, crucified with Christ, past tense. It's always past tense. When he says in Galatians 5, 20, I am crucified. You could say, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live for him who loved me and gave himself for me. So the living in the flesh empowered the, the mortal body being quickened by the Spirit, 
The flesh is not evil of itself, like you've been taught under this Romans 7 lie. Crucified the passions and desires, like Galatians 5.24 says. Those who are in Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, their evil, self-indulgence, rebellious heart has ceased. Washed, renewed, regenerated, new creation. Anybody that's in Christ, old things have passed away and all things become new. Well, how can all things become new if you're the chief of sinners, if you're the wretched man with a defiled heart all day long? How can you even read that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.17 and even imagine that you're new in Christ or you're empowered by the Spirit? I say if you're empowered by the Spirit, you've got a pure heart in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. That's what the scriptures say. It's like it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously, godly, in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. You're not going to go to those lawless deeds. If you're in Christ, you're not committing lawless deeds. The lust is dead. The pornography is dead. The drunkenness, the adultery, the fornication, the sodomy, all of it's dead in Christ. If he can't put that to death, then what is salvation? What is the new birth if that can't be put to death in Christ? What is it, just a psychology course? Just a self-help 12-step program? That's what it's boiled down to in, in the churches. And it seems to be what it's boiled down to in many of the people on, out, on, out here on the channels. That it's some kind of self-help program. Like these bit people that put video, these little short videos up. Christians who sin. Christians that are addicted to lust. Well, how can a Christian be addicted to anything but to the Lord Jesus Christ? And to righteousness and holiness. According to the scriptures, but no, in their mind... They're living this double life of a double-minded man. Of course, the James said, we receive nothing from the Lord. But they're living a double life in this halfway in-between world that they think they're righteous by some magic imputation because of what Christ did. Instead of you following his example and putting to death, putting to death your passions and desires, to die to sin and live to righteousness. That's what the scriptures teach. In 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, in verses 3 and 4, we quote it all the time. His divine power has given us all things, not just some things, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, his godliness and self-control, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which he has also given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may escape the corruption we may be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. That verse is astounding. Absolutely astounding. Taking it, just taking it face value, he's redeemed you from every lawless deed, set free from sin, partaking of actual divine nature, and saved from the corrupting influence of sin in the past tense. Peter's talking about here. And for this reason, what do we do? We'd be ever more diligent to add to our faith, to add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and on and on it goes. If you don't do that, then, you, of course, you're going to fall into deception, the error of the wicked, and you're not going to make it into the kingdom if you were ever redeemed to begin with. So how can you be a partaker of divine nature, redeemed from every lawless deed, you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, all things that pertain to life and godliness, freely given, Exceedingly great and precious promises, but now I'm the wretched man. i got a desperately wicked heart. The root of evil remains in my flesh. All those things describe people that aren't in Christ in the Scriptures. And you better get that into your head or you're never going to be born again of the Spirit. You've got to get that straight. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we're no longer slaves to sin, and then he says in verse uh, 12 of that, how can we who have died, to, I mean verse 2, how can we who have died to sin live any longer therein? So sin shall not reign in your mortal body to obey its lust. 
The summary of Romans chapter 6, minus the do not present your instruments of, instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but as instruments of righteousness to God. See, that's something you have to do. That's something you have to put into practice. You have to put it right now, the volition of your will, determined that you're going to cease from your rebellious heart and utilize the exceedingly great and precious promises that are there for those that can be redeemed in Christ. So the old man was crucified. Again, past tense. In the Greek, it actually teaches in the aorist, present, perfect tense, done, not to be repeated. The focus always being on the action performed. Something that, an action that took place in the past, it began at a certain point, ended at a certain point, not to be repeated. That's exactly what it teaches. But yet so few people seem to understand this. And they get caught up that, it, well, you keep doing it. You keep putting to death the old man, and, uh, and then maybe you're going to get sanctified. No, you get sanctified in Christ when your heart is purified by faith. Because a heart purified by faith is a heart that's going to be obedient unto Christ, obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, you obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine in Christ, in which, you know, you've been set free from sin and become a slave of righteousness. See, the form of doctrine that delivered you from that body of sin that you keep crying about that you're still in. Well, the body of sin is just your mindset addicted to your selfish passions and desires that you want to serve. So you want to drag it into the kingdom in such a way that you can justify it by the scriptures. Well, that's not what the scripture says again. The old man was crucified. He's put to death. How can you have died to sin, live any longer therein? How can, he, how can someone dead still serve that body of lust if you put it to death? So you're drawn away and enticed by your lusts. Each one is, is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed, meaning taken captive, like in James 1.15. Well, if that lust is put to death, then that, that drawn away and taken captive is not going to take place because there's a way of escape from temp temptation. So, have crucified, was crucified, I am crucified, all in the same idea of taking place in the past, done, not to be repeated. Jesus said, when the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Free from what? If you're the wretched man. Free from what? If you're defiled heart. If you're still the chief of sinners. If you still got sin in you. And you got to run around confessing you got sin in you. How can you be set free? If you commit sin Again, that's that word paeo, you're producing sin in your life, a bad tree producing bad fruit. Then you're a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Just like Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says you escaped indeed from those that live in error. Escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust indeed. Well, if you're still addicted to lust, struggling with lust, then you've not escaped. It's pretty simple. So Paul, after his conversion, he says in many places in the scriptures, Acts 24, 16, I always strive to have a conscience without offense towards man, God and men. See, blameless, as he says in the next, next one here. He says, invitate me as I invitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Your witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believed. 1 Thessalonians 2, 10. Now how could he be the chief of sinners, Romans wretch, and be blameless and without offense towards God and men? Ask yourself that question next time before you post that on some blog. How foolish that is. Paul said he was blameless and without offense. I thank God who I serve with a pure conscience, he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.3. In another scripture, he says, Pray for us that we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, and living honorably before men in Hebrews 13, 18. That's just a few of a description of him after his conversion. See, he was formally a blast, formally the chief of sinners. Not on and gone. Don't accuse someone of sin because you're sinning all the time. 
Don't try to drag them down to your level in the mud and make Christ a minister of sin because you sin all the time. Come to an understanding that you can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust through Christ, but it's going to be a painful experience of repentance for you because you've been so deceived. See, the solid foundation stands having this for its seal, that anyone that knows, anyone, the Lord knows those who are his, and anybody that names the name of Christ must depart from iniquity, 2 Timothy 2.19. God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from your heart. That's where faith originates. You obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Therefore Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourself with also the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. S suffered in what? Suffered in that season of godly sorrow and repentance, that brokenness, that breaking up of the fallow ground that preparing the heart to receive that engrafted word so to take root. He ceased from sin, must cease. The rebellion must cease in repentance or it will never cease. That's 1 Peter 4.1. And hereby we know that we are in him if we keep his commandments. He that saith that I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So how's that for you to say, well, I have no sin. Well, you're not even keeping his commandments. No wonder there's sin in you all the time. That's the liar. That the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. In Romans 8, 4 and 8, 2, as we quoted earlier. Well, yes, because faith upholds and establishes the moral law of God. We make void the law through faith? No, we establish it, Romans 3.31. It's the law of faith, faith working by love, purifying the heart of sin through obedience to the truth, and having victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. That's the law of faith in the scriptures. So then you could say, whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth has not seen him nor known him in 1 John 3.6. We know that whoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is born, begotten of him keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. 1 John 5, 18. See, God's going to render to each one according to his deeds. In this, done in this body. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. In Romans 2, 6, 6 through 8. So if you think you got a magic cover, if you think it's assured, no matter what you do, that God doesn't see you sin and he only sees Jesus, that's all a fallacy that's been handed down for generation after generation. You will be judged according to what you do in this body. Yes, salvation is conditional on what you do. Initially, the past sins are remitted by the blood. That's the free gift of grace. But when you enter into the covenant relationship with God, you must keep that covenant by obedience, he says, I keep covenant and mercy with, to a thousand generations to those that love me and keep my commandments, he says in the scriptures. Covenant and mercy in Christ, yes, to remit those past sins that we can't remit. That's the one thing we cannot do. The blood must remit those past sins in repentance. But obedience we can render unto God that love me and keep my commandments. And then you'll be in covenant. Well, what breaks a covenant? The same thing in marriage. What breaks a marriage? Unfaithfulness, infidelity. The same thing in Christ. Adulterate yourself with the world. Then you've broken the covenant with God and you're facing a bitter repentance. But many of you are trampling the blood and insulting the spirit of grace and crucifying him of flesh, but you've never came into Christ to begin with, as we've talked about in many of our lessons. He says in Revelation in a couple of places about worthiness, he says, There are a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white before they are worthy. And then in Revelation 19, I alluded to before, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. See, there is a righteousness in faith when you walk by faith, keeping his commandments. 
Not a righteousness that you conjured up by the law or sacrifices or keeping days and months in obedience to this or that, but a righteousness in Christ that truly is a, mor a morality and a virtue, an uprightness and moral uprightness that the world can witness in your life if you're in Christ. That's the righteousness we talk about. Not a self-righteousness, but he who does what is right is righteous as he is righteous, meaning that he is walking in the light, purged, purified, set free from sin, partaker of the divine nature, redeemed from every lawless deed, is doing what is right by a faith working by love. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do wickedness and iniquity and lawlessness. The wretched man, the chief of sinners, sin every day. He's going to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. That's what the scriptures teach of before and after. And that's what it means to be in Christ or not in Christ. It's very, very simple. If you're caught in that halfway world, there is a way out for you. Don't despair that, well, how can I ever stop sinning? There is a way in Christ, but you have to put forth that effort. We are workers together with him. Remember that that we receive not the grace of God in vain. The grace of God is supposed to come in and cleanse and teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously in this present age. If it's not doing that in your life, you've not received the grace of God. You may think so, but if you received it to no purpose and without effect, that's what it means, in vain. So without that working together with God, then what Christ did on the cross will be of no value to you. What He did, it's not a substitute, it's not a replacement, it's not a satisfaction so that you can cop out on your responsibility. Now, your responsibility is to come clean with him in repentance once and for all. Empty yourself of guile and cease your rebellion and come before that throne of grace seeking his mercy and to find that reconciliation, that return to favor in Christ. And then finally to be washed, renewed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit in that miraculous new birth. That's going to set you on solid ground where you're going to sin not, where you're going to walk in the light, where you're going to say, this stuff is trash. I don't want to be the wretched man. I don't want to be the chief of sinners and making excuses all day long, living under that lie. You can live in Christ with a pure heart by faith and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust and overcome by faith. But you must make that effort to come to him now.